Hello, everyone. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's European Seed Innovation Series webinar. My name is Marshall Brands, and I serve as Editorial Director for European Seed. And today, I'm happy to be your host. Today's theme is Plants Are Talking to Grow Food Sustainably. Let's listen in. But before we begin, I'd like to take a minute to thank Vivent for partnering with us on this Innovation Series webinar. Presenting today are Dr. Nigel Walbridge, Dr. Andre Kurenda, and Thomas Mitchell. Nigel is an internationally renowned serial entrepreneur and co-founder of Vivent. With a PhD in biomedical engineering and an MBA from INSEAD, he has founded several high-tech businesses linked to information and communication networks. He is a strong believer in technology as a tool to improve the health of people, plants, and the environment. Andre is the chief scientific officer at Vivent and has worked for over 10 years in plant electrophysiology and molecular biology research. Besides extensive experience in electrophysiology, he brings in-depth knowledge of molecular biology and microscopy to Vivent's team. His strong analytical and data processing skills enable him to quickly gain insights from the large data sets at Vivent's world-leading plant electrophysiology library. Thomas develops state-of-the-art models to decipher and predict the internal state of plants at Vivent. As well as his experience developing and deploying models, building distributed streaming pipelines, and architecting backend infrastructure, Thomas brings a strong DevOps and agile culture to the team, which he approaches with the same rigor he applied to his ones and zeros. During the presentation, you'll likely have some questions for our speakers. Please type these into the chat box at any time during the webinar, and we'll address them during the Q&A session after the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available at european-seed.com following the webinar. In today's webinar, you'll learn more about sophisticated information networks that plants use to sense and react to their environments. How tapping into these inf information networks using electrophysiology enables you to monitor plant reactions in real time, how Vivent records plant signals and builds machine learning models to predict plant responses to a wider range of stressors, both abiotic and biotic, and how you can use electrophysiology to speed up trait analysis, detect pests and pathogens, or optimize growing conditions. Nigel, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to say how much we appreciate the time uh, you've given us to uh, listen to our story today. Vivent, in its short life so far, has proved to be an extremely lucky company. And there's one particular aspect of its good fortune that, uh, that I'd like to highlight at the start of my presentation. We didn't start Vivent with a particular commercial model in mind. We just thought it was an interesting idea to think about biological systems and whether the kind of net we've spent all of our working lives in in man-made networks. And we wondered whether it was possible to treat biological systems in the same way as man-made networks and to derive and to use some of the tools and information that we get from man-made networks and try and apply those in biology. Fairly early on in the story, for a variety of reasons, we focused on plants and and we found the signals relatively easily. And then we started to be able to interpret the signals relatively easily. As a result of that, we decided to go ahead and to try and develop commercial products in the area of plant electrophysiology. Now, the piece of good, good fortune I want to highlight to you is that when we went to customers, when we started talking to customers about this idea, they were immediately enthusiastic because they felt the need. They felt the need for information from plants. All sectors of agriculture looked at us and said, we have amazingly sophisticated sensor systems now, which we can use to make very complex decisions about the environment and the state of our plants. 
But what we lack is uh, information from the plants themselves. And it seems that you may have a technology which fills that gap. We certainly don't think it's the most, the only information that's relevant to a grower or a researcher or a, or a seed operation or a breeder. But we do, we do think we add something special in this information that you can get live from plants. And in fact, over here on, on, in our office, we have a big uh, large screen TV with information coming from plants and, and looking at two tomato plants growing in a greenhouse operation uh, west of here. And it's, there's just a huge amount of information. There's a huge amount of information flowing backwards and forwards through the stem of the plant. And if the, and the, the kind of position, the point, the, the point of this webinar today is for us to convince you how much information is there. And then the challenge between us is to find a way of, of really filtering the information. There's huge amounts of information going backwards and forwards in a plant and potentially between plants. And we need to work together to find ways to extract the information which is relevant to you and which enables you to do your job better. The roots of, uh, of our um, uh, business are, are long and varied. And uh, they start in the early, early 20th century with this remarkable Indian scientist, Jagadir Chandra Bose, uh, who is most famous. He was, he, he, his skill was detecting electrical signals. And, and he's most famous for doing it for uh, Guglielmo Marconi. He was the person who built uh, Marconi's most successful radio receiver, but he also applied uh, his skills to the measurement of, of electrical signals in plants and uh, is definitely a pioneer in this field. Claude Shannon in 1948 is the founder of information theory. In his classic 1948 paper, Mathematical Theory of Information, he developed the concept of the bit and talked about why information is a logarithmic quantity rather than a, a linear quantity. And he laid the foundations for virtually all of networking, uh, man-made networking. Today, whether he would have been, whether he thought his mathematics was really applicable to biological systems would, is open to question. But his theory is absolutely fundamental to what we do. Hodgkin and Huxley, in their work before the war and then after the war, uh, studied the electrical properties of cell membranes. And in fact, they, they took a cell membrane and they modeled it as an electrical circuit. So there was this kind of crossover between biology and electrical engineering, which is something I hope that we are which we are mirroring in a, in a later age. Bonnie Basler in the early 2000s is most noted for her work on quorum signaling between bacteria. Basler highlighted that, in, in not, that even very simple organisms like, like uh, bacteria have a sophisticated language with which they communicate with each other. And of course, if bacteria can do it, plants are much more sophisticated managers of information and uh, because of their sessile nature, the information flows uh, 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 along established paths. And uh, so you end up with today the uh, situation where we are starting to interpret what the, the information that's passing backwards and forwards along the uh, stems of plants. Now, we, we, uh, we knew when we set out, we had to be rigorous about what we've done. So we, uh, we have spent a lot of time and energy with some fantastic uh, academic partners building a a strong scientific base for what we do. We've published lots of papers. Uh, you're always proudest of your most recent paper. And I'm just going to read that title out to you. Early diagnosis of iron deficiency in commercial tomato crop using electrical signals. So this is a, a paper about how you can use these signals to determine if your plant is getting enough iron. And that's an early example of just how good we're getting at, at interpreting these signals, but in, in reality, it's how less bad we are at, uh, at, at interpreting these signals. It's early days, but we're making fantastic progress. Just a bit of background, Vivent is the company name, Vital Science is the name of the products and services that we uh, deliver into the agricultural sector. We're a Swiss company. We already have contracts with growers, research institutes, agrochemical companies in uh, Europe and North America, but we're also dispatching equipment as we speak to Asia and Africa. And so uh, things are changing very rapidly indeed for us. Our B Corp certification is under review. We're still 80% owned by the founders and employees. And possibly most importantly, we have worked at this fantastically picturesque greenhouse facility in Conte, east of here in Valais in Switzerland, where we have generated 
by far the world's largest library of uh, plant electrophysiology data. And uh, our partners there, have, we've, been we've been generating signals there for nearly three years, and this has helped us build up this huge reference library. How does plant electrophysiology fit in with other uh, plant signaling mechanisms? Well, we'd, we certainly don't want to give the impression, and we certainly don't believe that electrical signals are the only uh, method by which plants transfer information. Probably more people are far more aware of chemical signaling methods, which is kind of equivalent to the endocrine system in humans, whereas the electrical system is maybe perhaps more in parallel with uh, the neural system. Mechanical signals all, uh, have also been proved to exist. There's some fantastic literature on that, particularly in France. In reality, all of these signals come together to form sophisticated communication mechanisms, which are fundamentally electrochemical in nature. And so when we talk about electrophysiology, we're not talking about large amounts of current flowing through the plant. We're talking about the state of uh, the depolarization of membranes in different parts of the uh, different parts of the plant. And if we can compare those, we can start to get the information out that we need. I'm gonna run through four slides here, which shows a, um, a caterpillar biting into a genetically modified Arabidopsis and, uh, and the effect of that bite and how the signal transfers through the plant. And you can find lots of videos of this kind of thing online, which uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these things, a few won't. So, so as we go on, we can see that the plant is, that the caterpillar has taken a bite and you can see the initial signs that the signal is being passed into the leaf on the left. And as the biting continues, the, si the signal spreads and becomes more intense. And then finally, the signal is passed around the whole of the plant. This is long distance signaling based on cell depolarization, the state of cell membrane depolarization around the plant. So to look at that aspect of our technology, we're going to pass over to uh, Angers, who's going to tell us, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the fundamentals of plant electrophysiology and how we can use it. In my first words, uh, words, I would like to welcome all viewers or all listeners, and thank you very much for your interest in our technology. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much for this nice overview on plant long distance uh, signaling. My name is Andrzej Kurenda, and I'm by education, experience, and interest plant electrophysiologist. As, as Marcel mentioned, over the last 10 years, I worked in academia on different aspects of, of mechanism of plant electrical signaling. And about one year ago, with great enthusiasm, I joined Vivent team to practically apply plant electrophysiology in agriculture. In my part uh, of webinar, I will focus exclusively on plant electrical signals and use cases which will indicate a range of potential agricultural, industrial, or scientific applications of the technology developed by Vivent. Nigel showed great visualization made using genetically modified plants and showing how signaling waves spread over throughout, throughout the whole plant. But what kind of forms do electrical signals recorded with Vivent's technology have and how we can use these signals to protect or control plants? Plant electrical signaling is one of the fastest forms of information propagation inside the plant organism. For example, electrical signals induced by insect feeding can travel across plant vascular bundles with velocity of centimeters per minute and shortly after can activate defense mechanisms in all tissues they are propagating through. On the scheme presented on the left side of the slide, Phytal sign device is connected to greenhouse grown, grown tomato plant. Device records an electrical potential difference between two points of a plant or between the crown and the plant with so-called active and reference electrodes. The electrical potential from tomato stem is filtered, amplified and recorded in the memory of the device according to the scheme. In the situation, if plant is attacked by insects, which is symbolized with a, with a red sign, with the red uh, letters, insect attack. Typical electrophysiological wood response, so-called slow wave potential or variation potential, will look like on the plot on the right, showing course of electrical potential changes in millivolts over time. Red arrows 
indicate approximate moment when slow wave potential was induced by insect feeding, and its beginning is described as a depolarization. To efficiently detect stress-induced electrical signals in a big sets of recordings, we are using machine learning approach. This approach allows us to differentiate stimulus-specific signals from other physiological and environmental signals and to indicate the timing and intensity of the stress. The duration of physiologically meaningful signals can vary from several seconds to several hours, and it is not possible to, de to detect or quantify all of them just with visual analysis in the recordings lasting weeks and taken from tens of the plants. Sometimes feature of electrical signals characteristic, uh, characteristics for specific stimulus are hardly visually detectable. Recognition of signal by machine learning algorithm is then based on carefully prepared sets of training data and advanced statistical approach. In the upper plot on the slide, we can see approximately three week long electrical potential recording originating from commercial, commercial tomato greenhouse. For instance, you can clearly see that journal rhythm as peaks during the day and lower voltage signals at night. But in this time scale, electrical signals from the time before and after insect application do not differ significantly. Analysis with Vivens general stress machine learning algorithm, however, indicated times and probabilities when insects in these signals were detected. This is presented on a lower plot as a series of red vertical increases correlated temporarily with electrical recordings. In this case, insect-specific signals were detected, especially in a period from 4th to 12th day after infestation, and frequency of their detection decreased shortly after chemical treatment. Electrical potential of plant cells changes not only during insect feeding, but also in response to a wide range of abiotic and abiotic stimuli, such as illumination, temperature, drought, nutrient deficiencies, bacterial infections, and, and, and many others. Here, I would like to present examples of Vivens technology use cases, which can help you to estimate its potential application in the seed industry. The use cases are stress detection in response to low temperatures, estimation of plant photosynthetic efficiency based on electrophysiological response to, to, to light, adaptation to environmental changes of different types of tomato cultivars, and early detection of trips on strawberries. Effect of low temperatures on plants is especially important at early stages of development or during flowering. Evaluation of electrophysiological responses to cold may be very useful in comparison of vulnerability of different plant varieties to this type of stress. On this slide, you see example of detection of tomato electrophysiological response to low temperature period. According to the legend presented on the left side of the slide, green and blue lines over the electrical potential graph on the right side of the slide indicate times of optimal or low greenhouse temperatures. Electrical recording in upper panel shows smooth journal pattern during time of optimal temperatures, but during low temperatures, high frequency oscillations appear. These times are indicated also with the blue frames. In the lower panel, you can see that stress related to low temperatures has been efficiently detected by machine learning algorithm during both low temperature periods. Another interesting use case is related to estimation of plant photosynthetic efficiency based on plants' electrophysiological response to illumination. This can be useful in screening for new varieties of plants using light energy more efficiently or plant culture condition optimization. On, on the right side of the slide, we can see schematic presentation of typical electrophysiological response um, of plant to illumination. Great part of the image indicates indicate time of the darkness and yellow part indicates day. During nighttime, electrical potential recordings are stable, but electrical signals start to increase just after onset of light and last for about two following hours. Scientific basis of this process are not understood, but we are collecting increasing amount of information indicating that in optimal conditions or in a better performing plants, 
the increase is more dynamic. This phenomenon can be easily quantified by measurement of kinetics of the light in these changes or just by measurement of the other amplitudes. On the right side of the slide, you can see six real recordings from tomato, from, from tomato plants grown in a, in a greenhouse. Red traces come from the from plants grown temporarily in suboptimal con, uh, con conditions, while green traces come from plants grown in optimal conditions. Responses of optimally grown plants are clearly more vibrant. Great example of potential practical application of electrophysiological response to changing environment is differentiation between tomato cultivars, which can be ideal for phenotyping in, compl in complex experimental designs. On the left side of the slide, we can see schematic presentation on how experimental condition, conditions change in this experiment. After at least one hour long adaptation to darkness, relatively low temperature, 18 degrees, and 75% air, air humidity, conditions were gradually changed over the next 15 minutes to about 500 micromoles of light, temperature of 25 degrees, and 55% humi humidity. After one hour, 30 minutes, environmental conditions were again gradually restored to initial values. On the right side of the slide, we can see normalized average electrophysiological plant responses of at least three individuals from three different tomato cultivars. ILSA, which can be considered as a wild type in this experiment, Admiro, commonly commercially grown tomato cultivar, and Flaca ILSA, which is abscisic acid deficient mutant affected in response to drought and other environmental conditions. All varieties of tomato responded to changing environment with increase of electrical potential, but kinetics of change and values at which electrical potential stabilized were, were, were different. This indicates different sensitivities of varieties and can be correlated with other agronomically important parameters as growth rate, yield, or resistance to undesired climate conditions. Pivot made also effective attempts to detect biological threats, which are hard to spot with other hard to spot visually or um, with other existing um, detection methods. As example, sucking insects extracting cells up, cells up in conditions of numerous attack may lead to weakening of the plant, leaf deformations, or, or necrosis. Additional ne negative effect of sucking insects is that they often they are often vectors from numerous viruses inducing sec secondary plant diseases. On this slide, we can see results from exciting collaboration between Vivent and Horticulture Business Unit of Wageningen University, focused on early detection of the trips feeding on strawberry plants. Time scale presented on both panels is seven days after insects application. Probabilities, probabilities in upper panel in green were obtained by analysis of electrophysiological signal from plant without trips and probabilities in lower panel in red come from plant which, which was exposed to trips attack. Clearly, probabilities indicate higher detection of insects induced electrophysiological signals in attack plant. Presented examples indicated only several from the total number of Vivent solutions, which can be used in modern agriculture, agriculture and possibly also in a seed industry. Except of presented use cases, Vivent's machine learning using Vivent's machine learning algorithms, we can target drought stress, nutrient defi deficits, detection of soil-borne pathogens and biting insects. Moreover, we are currently working on development of new machine learning algorithms to use for detection of bacterial and fungal infections, improved scouting, and autonomous horticulture. We are convinced that, that uh, phytocyan technology can have a great positive environmental impact by increasing yield, lowering plant culture costs and waste emission, and by improvement in, improvements in existing crop protection programs more about how we create our technology, how we create machine learning algorithms, you will hear from Vivens machine learning expert, Tommy Mitchum. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tommy, and I'm a machine learning engineer here at Viv, where I help develop and deploy machine learning models. 
I'm super excited about this because the field of machine learning applied to electrical potential plant signals is a brand new area of research. So I feel like I'm learning something new every day. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about how we can teach a machine to learn to read the raw electro, electrical potential plant signal and translate that into a classification of the internal state of a plant with regards to a specific stressor. I'll start my talk with a brief history of machine learning um, which isn't as old as plant electrophysiology, but it's about 70 years old now. I'll then talk about how and why we use machine learning, as well as what a typical trial with us looks like to develop a new model to target a specific stressor. Machine learning was born out of the field of artificial intelligence in about the 1950s, where researchers were developing large rule-based systems to try and uh, model the actions of intelligent agents. Now, a rule-based system is essentially a series of if-else statements surrounded by a knowledge base. For example, if we were to model the action of a plant blooming as a, as a rule-based system, we can do a really naive uh, example and say, if the plant detects that the weather has been sunny for the past three days, then bloom a flower. So a rule-based system is a series of if-else statements surrounded by a knowledge base. They actually work really well for uh, controlled discrete environments, um, but they actually they start to become very complex and break down when the nature of the data becomes more difficult or the nature of the problem. For example, when modeling natural phenomena. As an example, let's just sort of walk through an example of building a rule-based system, starting with our naive model from before. So if, if the plant detects that the, there are three sunny days, then create a flower, that that model quickly breaks down because you can imagine that there, be, there are you know, three sunny days in the middle of winter. Okay, so let's add a new rule. So three sunny days and during those days, the temperature needs to be above X. All right, that's a little bit better. Um, but let's just consider a few of the other variables we would need to take into account when manually writing these rule sets. We would need to say, we'd need to take into account the length of the day, um, the exposure of sunlight to the branch that we're modeling the blooming on, what's the uh, soil moisture of the plant at the moment, and how about the nutrient levels? Um, so you can see how a, a rule-based approach where you're manually creating these large rule sets would quickly break down and become brittle. Luckily, machine learning is really good at identifying patterns within the data. And that's actually where machine learning started taking off when the paradigm shifted away from building these large complicated rule sets to model intelligent agents towards a practice of providing a large data set to the machine as well as the observations during that data set so the labels and letting the machine work out the mapping between the two so in our blooming example we would choose a, a plant variety let's say a tulip and we would provide the machine with a year's worth of tulip data that would be our data set so now we would also provide the days in which that in that year where the tulip bloomed. Those would be our labels. The machine would then be able to work out, it would be able to look at a, a blooming event on a certain day in our labels and identify the patterns in the weeks, hours, or days preceding that event, which led to its occurrence. So the machine can identify specific patterns within the data to map towards a label. Okay, so we've framed the problem of machine learning as teaching the machine to map between the data set and, it, and our labels. So how do we actually use that at Vivent and why do we use it? Well, the first reason is for the automatic diagnosis of the internal state of a plant. Let's have a look at our diagram here. On the left, you can see a bunch of gray plants that are each, that are each emitting electrical signals, communicating with the cells within themselves and their neighbors. So at the moment, we don't actually know the state of the plant. Uh, they're all, we're, we have to assume that they're all behaving normally as they would in the wild. What we can do is we can apply a nutrient deficiency, say, to half of these plants. And that way we know that these are now plants behaving in a nutrient deficient state. Once we have those two groups, we can teach a machine learning model to separate those two groups and to learn the differences in the electrical potential signal that helps identify these two groups. So in that way, we're going from a previously unknown state of all gray plants and passing those data signals through to color the plant either green, if it's one of the normal plants, or yellow, if it's one of the plants that we, that we uh, applied nutrient deficiency to. 
So what's great is once the machine has learned to identify this mapping between a signal and a plant state, you can take that model and put it in front of any number of new plant signals that it has never seen before to provide an automatic real-time classification of whether the, the new plant is exhibiting behavior similar to a normal condition or a stressed condition, a nutrient deficient condition. Another way we can use machine learning is to provide recommendations about growing conditions. So as Nigel mentioned earlier, we have the largest global repository of electrical potential plant signals, which means that we're able to identify what normal looks like for a plant variety. That means that we're able to identify outliers in the greenhouse and provide recommendations around those outliers to optimize their growing conditions. Okay, so we've talked about training a model to identify a specific stressor based on the plant signal. Let's talk about, let's talk through an example of our iron deficiency model that we helped develop in conjunction with Agroscope for the early detection of iron deficiency in tomato plants. This graph on the left shows the electrical potential plant signal over the three week uh, experimental period for the iron deficiency experiment. On the y-axis, we have the electrical potential, so the raw plant signal in millivolts, and the days of the experiment are on the x-axis. You can see that on, well, on day zero, that's when we stopped giving iron to the plant. You can see by the green bar on top that there were no visual symptoms during those eight days after we stopped giving iron to the plant. And then on day eight, the plant started turning pale green before going into chlorosis on the 10th day. Something to note about the signal on a sort of macroscopic scale is that from here, it's really hard to tell the difference between the period of comfort before day zero and the period when the iron deficiency was applied, let alone the different stages of iron deficiency. I mean, perhaps you can say that there was an increase in fast frequencies, but that's really hard to, for a human to tell, especially because plants are so different. So now let's look at the graph on the right, which shows the predictions that a plant is in a healthy state according to the iron deficiency model. And this runs over the same three week experiment as, as the signal on the left. So the y axis shows the prediction that the probability that a plant is in a healthy state according to our iron deficiency model. So if the values are one, that's the model saying very confidently that this plant is exhibiting behavior that is you know, normal to a healthy plant right now. And if the value is zero, the model is indicating that this plant is definitely iron deficient and somebody should come take a look at this right now. What we can see is during the course of the experiment, the model probabilities change to reflect the actual iron deficiency that was applied. So before day zero, the model probabilities sort of hover around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, where the model is essentially saying, I think that the plant is very healthy right now, you have nothing to worry about. After day zero, you can see the model probabilities enter this transition state where they dip below 0 0.6 and eventually end up in 0 0.3, 0 0.2 during the same time when the plant is actually in chlorosis. So what we can do with this is take this model and apply a threshold, say. We can apply a threshold to these probabilities and the model will indicate exactly when the model probabilities fall below that threshold. If the model probabilities fall below the threshold during the experiment time, an alert will be sent to your phone uh, to indicate that you should go probably go and check out the plant right now. So if we had set a threshold value of 0 0.6 here in this experiment, we would have gotten uh, an alert to our phone around day two saying that there's a risk that this plant is enter entering iron deficiency. You should go take a look at it. So an alert on day two would have been six days before visual symptoms started to arise in the plant. So what we've done here is talk through a model that has learned to read the raw signal on the left and translate that into the probability of the presence of the iron deficiency stressor on the right. But how does a, how does a model actually go about learning the signatures in the, in the signal that map towards a stressed plant on the right? In the next slide, I'm gonna talk through the process of developing a new model with us to target a specific stressor. So the process of developing a new model with us to target a, a stressor follows roughly these five steps. First, we need to design the experiment in order to capture the stressor in action. Um, we need to design the experiment and its protocols. So in this example, we have a set of plants that are gonna be in the control group and will be behaving normally during the, during the whole experiment and a set of plants that will belong to the stressor group. And that's, those are the plants that we will apply the stressor to during this experiment. 
it's important to note that during that you can have more categories as part of the experimental setup. If you want to test a, the effect of a certain treatment on the plant, you can have control plus treatment or stressor plus treatment. Uh, but for simplicity, I just kept it as two categories here. So once the experimental protocols have been set up, we are ready to go into the data acquisition phase. And that's where we run the experimental protocols and capture the stressor that we are applying to this plant in action in the electrical potential signal. This process typically lasts several weeks, but at the end of it, we have a really nice data set to be able to train a machine learning model to differentiate the two groups. The first thing that we do before entering, uh, when we start training a machine learning model is we split the whole data set into two groups. The first one is the training data set, which is the larger of the two on top here. The second data set at the bottom is the test data set, and that's what we're going to use to evaluate how good the model is. So during the training phase, the model will only see signals from the training data set. It will never see signals from the test data set until it uh, is being evaluated itself. So the only opportunity it has to learn the difference between the control group and the stressor group and exactly what it is in the signals that differentiate the two happen within the training data set. So once the model has learned to differentiate the groups within the training data set, we move to the evaluation phase against signals that the model has never seen before. The whole point of de developing a machine learning model is to create something that generalizes to plants that it has never seen before so that you can make inferences about the internal state of a plant for unseen plants uh, heading on into the future. So during the model evaluation phase, we predict, we evaluate how good the model is according to a certain metric against plant signals that the model has never seen before. Once the model has performed adequately well against uh, unseen plant data, we're then ready to deploy it in the greenhouse and we can put it on the device and put it in front of any number of unseen plants colored gray on the right hand box, pass them through the model. And if they're exhibiting behavior similar to a healthy plant, they'll be colored green or healthy. And if they're exhibiting certain signatures that were similar in the stressor applied group during the training phase, the model will paint it yellow or stressed. So that was a little bit of an overview of the process of developing a new one of these models to target a specific stressor. I'm now going to hand over to Nigel, who's going to talk to you about how we can optimize growing conditions by identifying trends. When we set out to commercialize the product, we thought the main things people would be interested in would be early detection of disease, early detection of uh, phenotypes, looking, for example, whether crop interventions in the greenhouse caused stress. But as we moved along, we began to realize that we could also give growers an indication of whether they were achieving the optimum conditions that the best growers achieve. So this slide is meant to give you an indication of that. We can instead we can kind of flip the idea on its side and instead of saying what's wrong with my plant, why is it stressed, you can say these are conditions which are uh, equivalent to the best growing conditions for a plant. And so this is a yet again a new way we can try and um, interpret the information that we're getting from plants. So I set out by saying that uh, Vivent has turned out to be a lucky business. It, it's very lucky because we found a real need. People really want to know, really want to have real-time information from their plants. They can feed that into all kinds of decision support systems. They can make uh, earlier decisions about crop treatments. They can reduce the amount of pesticide they use. They can stop using too much water. They can stop over fertilizing. There's a whole range of things that the information can be used for. We're lucky because we've got some, we've managed to attract some great people into our relatively new business. We've attracted some fantastic investors into our new business. And probably most importantly, we've attracted some fantastic customers who are helping us to work with understanding these signals in plants. The, the question isn't, as we suggested in the title to the presentation, um, there isn't a question about whether plants are talking or not. The question is, how can we translate it to our advantage? What are the questions that we need to ask to get plants to provide the information that will help us to grow more food uh, in a more environmentally sustainable way, better tasting food, to do all the things that uh, the agricultural uh, industry wants to do to innovate as it moves uh, into, the, into the next uh, generation? 
it's been a it's been a fantastic ride for us in the last 12 months despite it being a covid-19 world and a world where the tomato uh, brown rugos virus has affected the uh, tomato industry we've added customers we've added employees algorithms one of the interesting things that ha that's happened is that we've had to focus on connectivity we don't just send equipment out to customers and let them get on with it we've learned that it has to be a connected service so we can work together on interpreting the signals and that's a fundamental part of what we do we have a strong focus on france and the netherlands most of what we've done has been in controlled environment growing but we're just starting to uh, set out in uh, outdoor high value in high value outdoor crops we're very interested in the seed sector. Um, um, Marcel himself, uh, uh, who we spoke to very early on in our business, said, "This is this is fantastic for the seed industry. We haven't really had the uh, the growth yet in the seed industry that we'd like." And so that that was again one of the things that pushed us towards this uh, webinar. And that's it. Please, if you have any interest at all in what we have spoken to you about today, I hope that we've convinced you of the rigor of what we're doing. It's at the start of a journey. There are many things we have to learn and we will learn them faster in collaboration with our customers. Back to you, Marcel. Thank you, Nigel. And thank you, Angé and Thomas as well, of course, for this uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation. I'd like now to go into a, a Q&A a session. We have received uh, numerous questions in the chat box. Here is a question. The device works by monitoring a single plant. Uh, how can you apply it to a crop? So, uh, yes, we, with a pair of electrodes, we can measure signals from one plant, but our sensor has uh, eight channels, so we can measure eight plants at a time. And we measuring signals just uh, by inserting sensors or electrodes into the plant tissue at specific points. Is this... Um, yeah, I hope this will be. This is quite a um, good explanation of this. How we how we measuring um, signals from sets of plants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question is: Is the model constantly improving, even after the developmental phase? Uh, in other words, uh, are there further experimentations in the field that are contributing to the machine learning? This is a fantastic question uh, because it is really at the crux of deploying models and, and the challenges that it brings. Um, it's absolutely possible to include any additional data that you record into a new machine learning model. But if no retraining strategy has been thought of, then that same model will remain the same model. With uh, it'll, it'll remain the same. But retraining is a really important part of deploying machine learning models. It's great. Here's another question. Is the program available for individual farmers? And if yes, what would be the cost of licensing or setup for, for example, two plants? It would be roughly uh, uh, one, a rental on 100, about 100 euros per month. Mm -hmm. That's extremely cheap. Hmm. That's a very good deal. Uh, so yes, and and you have the the, the machinery available. Yes, yes, we could uh, we could deliver tomorrow. Uh, just out of my own curiosity, how how big or how small is 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 the sensor and, and the machine? Isn't that ridiculous? I haven't got one on my desk, and I should have, but it is roughly the same as this packet of uh, tissues. Okay, okay, okay. That's a, that's a good indicator. Can your model differentiate between a root pathogen infection or a drought stress? So this, this is all about how you design the training data set for the model and design the categories of the model. Uh, if you create a specific model to target those specific stressors, you can have one model that would target both, or you can have two, two models that are targeting each separate stressor. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, there, there have been a, a few questions all uh, on, on those uh, different uh, types of stressors. Here, here's another one. Is it possible that two anomalies, two stressors, produce two electric signals which cancel each other? Ah, 
or produce a signal that is similar to a third anomaly. Isn't that a beautiful idea? Isn't it a beautiful idea? But if, if you think that plant has developed over millennia uh, a communication system to deal with multiple stresses, which it must have, then uh, I don't think it makes it any easier for us to detect. It certainly makes it harder for us to detect. But the plant itself will be able to distinguish, and uh, so should we. Mm -mm. And now you've been <laughs> the, the electrophysiology. And here's another question. Why would you not directly model the physics? Have you considered it? Have you tried it? The physics. So, uh, yes. So... This is this is this is beautiful, and it speaks to uh, conversations we have here all the time. Should we be looking at the fundamentals, or should we be looking at the, if you like, the aggregate signal? And uh, and of course, we will get better and better at looking at the individual specific conversations in plants. But right now, we're just listening to the football crowd. We are like a we are like we're standing outside the football ground with a microphone. And we can't hear individuals asking for another beer, but we can hear when a goal is scored because the whole crowd reacts. And that, those, are the, those are the levels of the signals that we are working with today. Yeah, that's a very nice analogy that, that immediately made it much clearer in my head. <laughs> and basically with refining the technology, you will be able to hear the referees' whistles. And, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, Shouting of the coach and so on and so yes, forth. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. That's brilliant. Um, so, what kind, what uh, TRL level, technology readiness level, have you reached today with this new service? I'm not a TRL expert. That, that's elsewhere in the company, but I would say we're in commercial deployment, which I think is eight or nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's indeed. How do the models single out? The deficiencies when multiple stress factors happen simultaneously. This is mathematics, yeah. Tommy. So the model is trained to identify only the, the specific signal in which it was trained for. So in order to analyze exactly what the model has learned, you would need to break apart the model and look inside of it. Um, but essentially, the model is focusing only on the stressor that was applied during its training set, during its training data set. I think it's really one really important membrane you have to get through in understanding this is as scientists, we've been trained for years to look at graphs. And if we can't see the difference between two graphs, we kind of assume that the machine can't see the difference between two graphs. But that's completely wrong. The machine looks at graphs in a different way and can pick out things that we can't pick out. We've heard quite a bit about protected crops. Um, you mentioned tomato and, and, and some other greenhouse crops. Can, is it also possible to create a model for arable crops? Yes, it certainly is. And I think that we'll be where we arable crops. By that, I guess we mean the, uh, the large broad acre crops like uh, rice and wheat and soy. And we have done experiments on soy and we have done experiments on maize. Wheat, we think is just a challenge from the kind of, just from the physical. It's a, it's a very thin piece of grass. We will get there today. That, so we're not going to be able to do wheat in the next six months. A year from now, we hope to have uh, upgraded um, uh, electrodes that will be able to cope with those uh, very thin monocots. And, and, and it makes, I think, more sense to, to go for the high-end, valuable, high-value crops, of course. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Is it possible to predict growth potentials? Yes. Yes, it is, but not but not with just our data alone. I think that that, I think that, I think we would definitely be in a strong position to, uh, to add to yield predict, prediction algorithms, um, but we would need to be combined with other, you know, with predictive data around the environment and, uh, and, uh, and plans for inputs and all of those sorts of things. But I think that that idea, um, the graph with the, with the kind of diurnal rhythm would definitely um, provide uh, increased information for those kinds of yield predicting algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a question about the amount of fruit and vegetables that have been researched so far. And I believe it was on one of the previous slides. Yeah, so we put on this slide only some, some of the 
vegetables or plants mm -hmm. we have tested. Okay. I think till now we tested maybe 30 different species, including uh -huh. including monocots, uh, herbal plants, uh, tree species or, or woody species. Mm -mm. And we are working on many, many more. <laughs> so I think that there's an interesting point was do all these plants speak the same language? And, uh, and, and we suspect that there are subtle differences, which we have not detected so far. In terms of the football ground analogy, strawberries cheer for a goal in pretty much the same way that apple trees cheer for a goal or, or boo the referee or whatever, whatever the kind of aggregate signal is, the strong commonality between all the species that we have tested so far. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a, a Scottish supporter would uh, sound differently than an Irish or Welsh yeah, yeah. supporter. Yeah. But but cheering a goal is is pretty identifiable whether you're in Dublin or in Edinburgh. <laughs> but we have we have scientific approach to that, and now we have whole scientific project which main aim is to respond to this question whether the signals between the plants are similar or are they different. Well, gentlemen, we have reached the full hour. Uh, and I'm afraid that's, that's all the time that we have uh, for today. I'd like to thank again our speakers, Nigel, Anjay, and, and Thomas, for, for, joining, for joining us today and uh, for Vivent for making this webinar possible. A very big thank you to everybody participating and for your uh, lively questions. I hope you have found this information of value. Again, as I said at the beginning, a recording of this webinar will be made available in the next 24 hours at our website, european-seed.com. Thanks again, and I hope you all have a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.